Is it a boat or a plane? Or perhaps a praying mantis? The Kiwi's speed addiction. Nice eyes. Why building a J-Class is child's play. Hardcore in the Caribbean. Why it's all about drag. And of course, plenty in Doc Talk. But first, there's a need for speed out there at the moment. And not just a fast blast for the hell of it, proper speed, record breaking speed. And this is an area that professional kiteboarder Alex Kazerg knows a thing or two about. He's held the world sailing speed record twice in his career, both times on a kiteboard, and both times at over 50 knots. But since Paul Larson raised the bar to 65.45 knots in 2012, he's kept the record out of everyone's reach so far, at least for 10 years. But Kaizeg is mounting a comeback with another kite-powered machine. And it's not just about the record either, because his team believe that there's a bigger future in sailing fast. The mission we have given to Sirocco is to develop de l'innovation de rupture parce qu'on pense que c'est le seul chemin possible pour vraiment aider à la transition énergétique. Vu le transport maritime est un domaine qui a très 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 peu évolué dans ces 50 dernières années et il y a tout un champ des possibles technologiques à développer pour rendre ce transport maritime plus neutre pour l'environnement. Cette innovation, on la crée en s'attaquant à des challenges hors du commun comme le record de vitesse. Tous les bateaux à voile fonctionnent à peu près de la même manière on contre l'eau et on, on utilise le vent. En revanche, nous, on a eu une approche très différente du concept de, de l'alignement des forces. Et on, on arrive à quelque chose d'extrêmement simple. On a réduit l'engin à sa plus simple expression. Et c'est ce qui nous semble être le plus efficace sur l'eau. Mais c'est aussi ce qui demande le plus de contrôle et le plus de, de recherche, parce que c'est quelque chose de nouveau. Si on prend l'exemple d'un catamaran, Si la force du vent augmente, 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 elle va augmenter jusqu'à un point où le catamaran il se retourne. Et ça, ça va être sa limite de puissance maximum. Nous, on veut s'affranchir de cette limite et pour s'en affranchir, on se rend compte que si on fait s'appliquer ces flèches, ces deux forces au même point, sur notre concept de speedcraft, on aligne ces deux forces pour que ce ne soit plus une limite pour nous en termes de puissance. The thing is that we define a geometry that will generate the formation of vapor by increasing the velocity of the flow around the, the foil. We cannot avoid this cavitation, so what we think is that we are going to use it in a steady way so that we can be stable during the run. We can profit from that so that we can reduce the friction on the surface. The record is a source of inspiration, a source of innovation. The sport is to wake up in the morning to search ce record justement être les plus rapide sur l'eau, plus de sportif. Et c'est sur cette route qu'on crée et qu'on innove. Et on ne peut pas simplement améliorer le record. Notre objectif est parti en 21 km. Aujourd'hui on se propose carrément de pulvériser le record. But the Sirocco Challenge are not alone in their quest. The Swiss SP80 project is a team of engineers and students based at EFPL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. They also have their eye on the prize. Their target is also 80 knots. They too see a future in fast marine transport. And in some ways their machine looks quite similar in that it's kite powered. But the SP80 has a larger hull structure that is in contact with the water, giving it the look of a giant carbon praying mantis. In simple terms, it's a boat in reverse, in that the main foil is at the stern in line with the kite control lines, with the rudder at the front. The most obvious difference between the SP80 and the Sirocco machine is that the Swiss hull looks heavier and has more drag in through the water. And if we've learned anything from Paul Larson's sail rocket campaign, it's that dragging foils through the water at any speed over 50 knots is where the bulk of the problems lie. 
Nevertheless, the SP80 team are soon to launch their full-size speed machine and are looking to set a new record this year. Which in turn leads us to the Kiwis and their need for speed. Having led the foiling agenda in the America's Cup for more than a decade and won the coveted trophy twice in a row, speed on the water is something that Emirates Team New Zealand are clearly pretty good at. But now they want to see if they can be the best on land as well, as they take on the wind-powered land speed record. Given how Cup teams are often talking about how they're always short of time, you might wonder why they're taking their eye off the Cup but they see it as a way of keeping designers and engineers sharp and engaged ahead of the next cup cycle. The team have set themselves an ambitious goal to get their new machine out of the shed and ready for shipping to Australia by Easter. The current record holder is Richard Jenkins, who set a new world record of 126.1 miles an hour back in 2009. The Kiwi Speed Machine appears to pick up where Jenkins left off, and we'll see Glenn Ashby as its pilot. Over the last few weeks, Emirates Team New Zealand have been documenting their campaign, and we pick up their story as Glenn Ashby explains what appeals to him about the challenge. Growing up in Bendigo in, in central Victoria in Australia, you know, I used to love mucking around with land yachts and uh, building things uh, as a kid. This has really been a long-term dream of mine since I was a, a little kid, the fire has been fueled to really put together um, you know, a, a proper package to, to actually go and have a go at it being really, really fast um, on land with a wind-powered craft. I think it might have taken Richard Jenkins, who's the current record holder, nearly 10 years to, to break the previous record. And um, it's not an easy feat. It's something that's a very, very difficult challenge. <laughs> Wow! Nice. Amazing! We're very tight with our production, really tight. Well, we know that we're guaranteed this way to build you the best part, and that's where we're at. We're going to have time to you know, review another process. Composite, capsule that Lenny's in, better survive a crash. So we made, I made two, two new refined FEA models to make sure we don't buckle or break in the, uh, in the cockpit or somewhere else. But, uh, we are very happy, yeah. So, yeah. so this is for the work of, you know, double, triple checking the stuff. We do it ourselves and then we, we, have, we, we ask double and triple checks sometimes. This is the safest thing I'll ever start in my life by miles. So. <laughs> Right. <laughs> We've gone from the design table, things actually happening from the production side of things. So the main vehicle body is now under construction. This craft is going to be such that momentum is going to be our friend and weight helps with momentum. So older techniques here, a bit more of the wet laminate as opposed to a lot of the pre prep which we use with our, our custom uh, America's Cup class yachts but it's really good to see you know, some resin and uh, carbon starting to go on the tools. It's a really useful project to keep the design team going on, on innovative ideas as well as the production side. While we've, we've got the wing in the air and there's a lot of similarities to a yacht, trying to keep the wheels on the ground, keep them gripping well, keep the rolling resistance really low, those are the real challenges for us. So little information out there about how well tyres grip on salt and the behaviour of them. I don't have a huge amount of knowledge in some of these areas, so yeah, there's a lot of research involved. We see our job as showing the world we, we can move without energy, without energy that is fossil or, or electric or whatever. Just think of driving your car on the motorway, uh, 205, it doesn't look much, okay? It's, maybe it's okay, you know, many of us did maybe try. But think that you have a 10 meter wing on top of your roof. It would be really interesting to do it where salt desert, like more or less where they did Mad Max. But it's, it's a very fun project to be honest. The first time I think that you shake the wing on on a salt lake in a craft that you've sort of been involved with, the design and build of, I think for the whole team will be 
extremely exciting and um, there'll be a lot of sort of unknowns that we'll have to learn and, and tick off but um, I think that feeling of you know doing in excess of 200 kilometres an hour um, in a purely wind powered craft. You know we've got some extremely clever guys behind the scenes ultimately all be involved in, in achieving hopefully something that um, no one else in the world has ever been able to do. One of our biggest challenges has been understanding how to get grip on the ground. So to stop the, the craft slipping sideways, we rely on tyres to bite into the salt. So that, that's where it differs a lot from a yacht, where you're on water, we just have a foil or a centreboard in the water which resists leeway. We've done as much research as we could possibly do in the time available to figure out what tyres are out there and what, what may work for us. This tyre here is a Goodyear land speed tyre. So these are not rated for highway use, they're a dedicated speed tyre. But they're just really attractive to us for the, the front end of, of the craft, the front wheel and in our side pod where we're really trying to get low rolling resistance. The back end is where we need the most grip, so that's when we come to the rear tyres and we we're going to run two two tyres in line. It allows us to keep the fuselage pretty narrow for low frontal windage, but it also lets us get two sets of um, feet on the ground. And then if we are hitting any mild undulations and we're momentarily losing a little bit of grip from one tyre, at least we, we're confident the chance of having to back step out and doing a bit of a drift is, is decreased. Uh, where possible, in terms of a lot of the hardware throughout the craft, we've tried to just buy existing components off the shelf. However, on the front wheel here, you can see this rim. This is a custom rim that we've designed and made, and it looks really flat on this side, and that, that's due to it having a, a really huge um, offset. Our main fuselage is kind of acting like a motorbike that we have one wheel out the front. It's really important that we have our steering axis centered exactly on the center of the tire. So in order to get the steering axis on the center line, we've had to make this rim. If we, if we didn't have that like that, we would get a lot of um, induced torque into the steering from the rolling resistance and that would just feed, feed back to the pilot basically having to fight the wheel the whole time. When we're testing, you know, we're for sure we're going to find some pretty strange behaviour from the tyres. I don't know which way it's going to go but we're either going to find that they're too grippy or not enough straight away. It's pretty exciting to think, you know, that those first days of testing what we'll learn. We're going to learn so much so quickly. So there's a date that this thing's going to roll down the tarmac. Yeah, there's a there's a date on paper still. Yeah, I did tweet, you know, like right now we've we've got Easter's the middle weekend of April, and right now that's still our target to basically have this craft ready to start testing. We the final tool is the wing tail and uh, flat detail, which Guillaume's going to release that surface uh, this week. Um, we're doing the cockpit uh, as well. It's getting machined um, later this week over this weekend. The progress has been pretty good so far over the last four weeks. We managed to build the shells, the main body, tailor into the bulkheads. More challenges to get this thing out of the door on time, which is always the same issue with us, you know, under the pump. But yeah, this thing here, well, I thought it was going to be easy. It's so tight inside, like there's so many processes to join her up. Everything's going to be pre flanged. And then down the aft end where all the structure is, it's just, there's no room, I don't know. We'll, we'll get there in the end, eh? Always do. Until quite recently, if you wanted to go faster than anyone else under sail, you needed to look to the ice. But developments in foiling on water are closing in on the long-time kings of speed. Nevertheless, ice yachting remains an amazing side of our sport, and if you ever get the chance, grab it. But as the ice boat season draws to a close, we've received some great footage. The DN class is probably the best known, and it's certainly the most popular class. But what caught my eye recently were two very different machines from either end of the spectrum, as shot by OVJ Photography on Lake Monona in Wisconsin. At one end, the Skeeters, the F1 machines of the ice boat world that can clock up over 80 miles an hour. The only restrictions for these boats is a maximum sail area of 75 square foot and a mast that's no taller than 28 foot 6 above the deck. 
At the other end, Henry Bosett used his drone to shoot this gorgeous South Bay scooter on Bantam Lake in Connecticut. Originally developed around Long Island, New York, the scooter's got four runners under the hull to stop it slipping sideways, while it's steered using a jib. That'll take a bit of getting used to. One of the first boat tests we ran on Planet Sail was the Oyster 565. Three years down the line and this model has proved to be a huge success. No pressure then for a bigger sister ship, the 595, that arrived on the scene towards the end of last year. Understandably, there was a huge amount of interest in this new Blue Water 60-footer. So Planet Sail was not only delighted to be the first to get aboard, but we were very excited about having three solid days to get to grips with her. This meant we could not only settle in to find out what makes this new 60-footer tick, but take some deep dives to explore the detail above and below decks. The link to our three-day test report is above and also on the YouTube description but you'll also find links to additional video reports on the accommodation, deck layout and systems within the main feature. Alternatively, head to the boat's kit and comments playlist at Planet Sail and you'll find all four videos there. In building their new Imoka 60 Malama, the 11th hour racing team learned a huge amount before the boat had even been launched, especially when it came to calculating the total carbon footprint. Now they've published their findings in a report that's freely available online. Within it, they identified the potential to cut the carbon footprint of the build by almost a third by ensuring that the boatyard and key suppliers were on a 100% renewable electricity tariff. They also point out how it can take 18 months of testing and trialling to implement new build processes and materials. They outline how sustainability needs to be part of the design brief and how improved recycling can be achieved while also saving money through better waste management. Plugs and moulds came under the spotlight too, with big gains possible by using flax and recycled carbon for non-structural parts. The overall message in the report is clear, it's time to get serious about sustainability. Running any event in 2021 was a major undertaking but the inaugural Aegean 600 went ahead last July and proved to be a resounding success. So much so that the Hellenic Offshore Racing Club will run the event again this year. The 600 mile course proved as popular for the tactical challenges as it did for the scenery. The wide variety of leg lengths, wind angles and wind speeds presented plenty for the crews to plan for and cope with, on a race course that threads its way around an area steeped in history. Last year's record pace was set at just under 72 hours by Carlo Alessandro Puri Negri's Far 70, Atalanta 2, skippered by Francesco De Angelis. The race is open to fully crewed and double-handed teams in both monohulls and multi-hulls and starts on the 10th of July. When you think of the materials and construction techniques that are required to build a classic J-Class yacht, Lego doesn't really spring to mind. And yet it did for Carl Kumstedt, who studied mechanical engineering, and his friend Winnie Honsey, who's studying naval architecture and maritime technologies. Like many of us, they were fascinated by the elegance of the J-Class, so they decided to design one on the computer using Lego bricks. It's an obvious choice, isn't it? Their templates were based on Svea and Lionheart, and using 4,500 virtual bricks, they spent 230 hours creating a model that's 1.25 metres long and 1.65 metres tall. But now they want to go further and build the model for real and take it on tour to shows, renting it out for presentations and the likes. To do so, they've started a crowdfunding programme. One day, maybe all boats will be built this way. 
or maybe not. It's still brilliant though. After missing a year for obvious reasons, the Royal Ocean Racing Club's Caribbean 600 was back and with a healthy fleet too. This 600 mile race that starts and finishes in Antigua and threads its way around the islands has become increasingly popular. For a course set in the trade winds it's a lot tougher than you might think, which I guess is why so many of the big names seem to come back year after year. But in the long list of worthy stories and impressive performances, two stood out for me this year. The first was that of Sunrise, Tom Neen's JPK 1180, the team that's still on a roll after cleaning up last season, winning the Fastnet overall, the season overall, and becoming the Rourke's Yacht of the Year. Guess what? Spoiler alert, they won this one too. The other team was that of Chris Sheehan, great name, no relation. His 52-footer Warrior One took the overall win in IRC. That's impressive, especially given the pressure from a fleet of Super Maxis double her size. Regatta director Chris Stone sets the scene. After a year off, back again, 2022, 74 entries this time. I mean, you can't ask for more than that, especially after you know COVID year and. 32 nations represented with, a, with a, some 750 sailors. I mean, it's just amazing. Up at Fort Charlotte, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you kind of forget about it once you, after, after a year and then you get back there and it's just to, to see all the boats racking up and you're in awe of the, the enormous cliffs and, and then just the beautiful sea below it. It just kind of moves and takes the fleet away around, around the corner of Antigua. It's just an incredible feeling. It's phenomenal just to, to see that sight. Yeah, IRC1 this year was a really competitive fleet. It was tough conditions for those guys in IRC1, but Sunrise came through again, um, you know, after a successful year with Rolex Fastnet. Behind them was close competition with Ed Bell and, and Dawn Treader. And then again, following up with them is um, Launch de Milan with Jacques Spalletier. And, and all of those guys were in uh, last year's Rolex Fastnet and really competitive and amazing. What I was expecting is a 20 knot blast around the Caribbean and what I got was a very technical, complicated race with a boat chasing us that were obviously putting on an amazing performance. <laughs> this is the first time that we've raced Dawn Treader in anger since before the Fastnet in 2021, so they gave us a hell of a race. From the start, all the way around, we knew they pushed it very hard and we were desperately trying to catch him and we got ahead of them a couple of times and then we lost it and then we lost by it looks like about 10 minutes. I would say it's the toughest race we've ever had with Don Treader. They have pushed us to the limit the whole way around. Yeah it was, it was really really good fun to, to, to have a, a tough competition all the way around. so much joy right now and uh, a huge amount of humility and I'm, I'm humbled to be to count myself among the winners who have been trying to win this race for as many years as she's been in existence and kudos to all those competitors I, I count myself to be very lucky among those who have won it. I would say the 600 rates as one of the hardest in the world. It's like I equate this to a, a 10 round heavyweight boxing match and the lefts and the rights and, the, and the, just keep coming at you and you're just doing and you're playing offense and you're playing defense and you're waiting for the knockout punch to hit you because at any moment you could park up for hours and lose your lead. No lead safe until the very end. 
we've instituted essentially a two and a half year testing program so that we know at every given angle, at every given wind strength, we know what our best sail combinations are. And we were testing uh, all the, the angles that we knew were gonna be key for this race. And then it's just all about execution. Part of the secret to the success is the team that we have. So having Stu Bannatyne and Richard Clark, and I can go every name right on down the boat, that is the reason for our success. And that's because these guys are at the elite end of the sport. And for me, I'm just lucky to be able to tag along with, with a group like this. They're just magnificent sailors. To win a race like this, you have to have you know, a, a, a perfectly prepared boat, a great team, the right sails, the right program, everything just goes into it to just give it that absolute level, you know, that, that you have to have in order to perform. What does a super yacht have in common with a New York City bus? Nothing is the answer, until that is you get under the hood, where both have the same BAE Systems diesel-electric hybrid power propulsion units. Southern Wind 96 No. 4 will be the first Southern Wind yacht with a hybrid system. But it's a choice that's starting to prove popular. Their 108-footer, which is due for delivery in early summer 2023, also has this configuration and the company expects to produce up to two hybrid yachts a year going forwards. Among the list of advantages, Southern Wind believe there are four key benefits. The ability to regenerate power through the propeller and keep batteries charged on passage. Then being able to operate silently thanks to the large battery capacity. Having two generators rather than one helps with the stringent emissions regulations. And four, the longevity of hybrid systems. The BAE system is rated for double the number of hours than that of a conventional single generator. J-boats are perhaps less well known for their cruisers than their performance boats. But their J45 is a reminder that boat speed isn't everything when it comes to cruising at pace. Although she shares the family DNA, under her skin she's subtly different. A moderate beam, a relatively deep canoe body, a sweeping shear line and a low freeboard sets her apart from many of her performance cruiser contemporaries. So too does her single rudder, 7 foot keel fin and her 4.2 tonne bulb. She's a classic performance cruiser designed to deliver consistently well whatever the conditions upwind or down. Aggressive modern hull forms may produce peaks of power at certain angles and wind speeds, but the 45 has been designed to be as comfortable when she's pressed as she is capable of sailing deep angles with ease. Add load carrying, a high writing moment and many more characteristics into the mix and J-Boat's formula for comfortable performance cruising is easy to see. Chris Nicholson can't get enough of offshore sailing. He's competed in six Volvo Ocean races and now he's about to notch up another one with a newly named Ocean Race. With so many miles under his belt, he knows a thing or two about what makes good offshore clothing and knows the hard facts. Get your clothing wrong and you can end up with rashes, which can then become infections. Not a good look offshore and not good for performance. He believes breathability isn't just about comfort, but health. And so do clothing manufacturer Zyke. After a comprehensive R&D program with the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and 50,000 miles of testing, Zyke have launched OFS 800, a new range of clothing that they believe will take breathability onto a new level. 
From key innovations such as headlock hood design to flexible anti-corrosion zips and many more, Zeig believe that they've engineered some big steps forward. Music to Nicholson's ears. Handling the biggest masts in the world is a complex process that extends well beyond stepping and commissioning. It's an area that Rondar know well. One of Rondar's projects was commissioning the rig of the 1100-ton Sea Eagle II. It's clearly a complex operation that requires a specialist team, but it's also a process that happens more regularly than you might think. Today, it's often a requirement to have a superyacht mast lifted, inspected and serviced every five years. Unstepping a superyacht mast involves plenty of detailed planning. Getting the mast out of the boat is a huge exercise in itself. But when removing just one piece of rigging requires at least four people on a mast that could typically have 14 items, the complex logistics are easy to see. And that's before the detailed inspection and servicing starts. Handling big spars requires a big operation. What makes a foiling moth so quick? I found out at the recent RYA dinghy and water sports show. And by the way, you can see the full show feature by following the link above and below. Now, one of the classes that we've covered quite a lot on Planet Sail is the International Foiling Moth. An incredible class, it seems to be constantly expanding. But even I hadn't realized quite how different the modern generation are. Look at this one, it's called an MD3. And the thing that really strikes me about this boat is that everything is about the aero. Look at how smooth it is. Look at these rounded sections here. Everything's smooth right the way around the wings here which are now completely integral all the control lines run under the deck so this is the these are the only bits of line that are actually exposed and in the air the whole thing is all about reducing the aerodynamic drag this comes from sort of a windsurfer kind of idea isn't it it's got this sort of package around here to clean up the airflow around this area and the whole thing extends right the way back even when we get back to the rudder stock here, it's all got a carbon fairing all in here. Everything's been smoothed off to reduce the drag. It's incredible. But if you really want to know the detail about it, you're going to talk to this man, Adam May. <laughs> Adam, you, I mean, you've spent ages in moths, haven't yeah. you, over the years. Tell me about this boat. Did I get it right? Was it, is it about aero? It's all about aero now, yeah. It, um, I was lucky enough to be involved in the development of this real early on. Um, a friend of mine, Gonzalo Redondo, did uh, aero studies on it. He, did, he ran the CFD department for American Magic. So actually when you zoom out, you actually notice a lot of the sort of aero tricks from the AC-75. So actually if you look closely, this now features a skeg underneath. Oh really? That um, it was an interesting study. Even though the boat, we're not seeing it close to the water like the 75s were, we still get to effectively improve the efficiency of the rig a little bit by doing it. So there's an interesting trade-off. Do you go for just minimum drag, or do you actually this actually improves the driving force a little bit? So it's been fun playing with with a number. Of and is that why we saw it? Because I remember looking on Luna Rossa. It was well, it wasn't quite this time last year, but when Luna Rossa came out for the Challenger series, they had a skeg, but it was a very short little skeg that ran. That's what they were trying to do as well, is it? Yeah, well, they were playing, it's partly the aero, but they were also doing more of the ceiling, but there's definitely an efficiency gain of the whole rig. It's an interesting one, because a moth is historically a really low aspect ratio rig. I mean, I sail an ACA as well, and then, you know, it's a lovely, elegant, high aspect ratio rig, and the moth has always been limited. But as we've gone lower and lower, these deck sweepers, you know, that's what, the efficiency of that is almost worse, but we've gained the efficiency by sealing the deck, and now the hull is acting as part of that sail. So it's how do you combine the two together to improve the whole efficiency. And so now it's all about cleaning up the airflow. You know, all the old wing bars of the past have gone. Everything's hidden below deck. It's all just 
making it work as a package, so it's really about blending the sail and the hull together. And that's where now the skeg is starting to form a bit of that sort of development. And so what are, what are the kind of gains that we're seeing now as a result of this compared to, I don't know, a generation of five years ago, something like that? Uh, well, they were a different boat from then. I mean, I'm only just getting back into the class, I've been busy with a cup and other and Olympic stuff, so I'm about to find that out for myself. But the speeds that these guys are doing now, it's, the moth class has been incredible. I remember when it was a big deal if you made the 20 knot club. Really? And now that's an upwind speed. Really? Is that right? And so what oh, are yeah. they doing downwind now? Well, these guys are casually going really close to 30s so and probably just over, but just, just shy of 30 is a pretty classical yeah. speed now. And upwind speeds, I mean, it depends on the moding, but you know, they all happily talk about 18 knots upwind. Really? Which is have, what we were and doing downwind. And do you think they've peaked now? It's probably in an interesting refinement stage now. But there's always gains in the foils. You know, the, the control system is always gains in that. So control system, foil refinement, the aero gains, and matching the the, the sail to the hull sort of package. Uh, I'm sure there's still gains to right. come. It's always amazing how much quicker they continue to get. And talking of numbers getting bigger, the price hasn't got any cheaper either, has it? I mean, what do they cost now? And this is quite expensive. Oh, well, no, I, I I I haven't officially heard, but. These, these are being made in Poland and then Ovington are sort of fitting out and finishing them, but I think this is in the 25,000 plus rig region, so the price is coming back down again. There right. was a silly period and I think it's, it's coming back down again, luckily. We're on the other side of that. Fascinating. All I need to do is to lose three stone, maybe four stone, and I'll be, I'll be on one. No, it likes a bit of writing moment, you'll be fine. <laughs> it's always good to speak to an expert. Thanks very much, Adam. Cheers. Good Cheers. to see you. You too. So once again, and as always, thanks so much for watching. Also a big thanks to our sponsors and partners who are such an important part of Planet Sail. And if you fancy getting involved, just drop us a line. Meanwhile, if you like what you saw and haven't subscribed, please do. It makes a big difference to how YouTube helps us spread the word. Plus, do keep letting us know what you think. We read all the messages and we love hearing from you. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, See you on the water, until next time.